welcome to Trace Community Church Online. We're so glad that you've tuned in with us this morning. Uh, we're going to spend some time in worship, and we're uh, excited to do that. I just want to acknowledge that it might be awkward uh, in your house uh, worshiping. It might feel a little awkward, and that's okay, because it's a little different from what we do here on Sunday mornings. Uh, but I really encourage you to, to, to turn, the, turn the volume up, get your Bluetooth speaker out, plug that sucker in, and turn it up, and because I think the louder it is, the less the other people in your house will hear you singing, and then you'll feel more comfortable. And uh, I, I know that it's it's easy to, to sit on the couch, but the thing is, God really deserves our worship, and he uh, will be exalted in all of our homes, uh, wherever we're out, whenever we're watching this, and he deserves it. We want to lift him high. So I encourage you to do that uh, this morning. Turn the volume up, and, um, and just sing your hearts out before God, and so I uh, hope you do that with us this morning. Um, but first, let me, let me pray for us. God, we just thank you uh, that your presence is with us in our homes, wherever we're watching this, Lord. And thank you that you, uh, we can worship you wherever we go, whatever we're doing, Lord. All throughout the week, we can lift you high, and you deserve that, Lord. We thank you for your presence. God, you are what sustains us through a difficult time in, in our lives. Lord, we can look to you um, for peace for hope, for strength, uh, for everything that we need, Lord. Thank you that when you're with us, we don't have to be afraid because our Heavenly Father's here. Um, and so we just, uh, we just, I just declare that um, over everybody watching this video, God, just that you would come in, that your Holy Spirit would just bring a supernatural peace over each and every one of us. And God, I just pray that you would help us to worship you. And uh, we just lift you high. We thank you, Lord. We love you. We worship you in Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, let's uh, let's sing.
trembles at his voice and trembles at his voice how great is our God sing with me how great is our God and all will see how great how great is our God And the end, the God. 
my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that cursed tree His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still, and all the
long to behold your glory. Jesus, thank you that you are so much more than we could ever ask or imagine. Thank you that you are so much better and more beautiful than we can really even begin to comprehend. God, may we be a reflection of your glory. May we as your church, as believers, as people who have spent time in your presence, may we be a reflection of you. God, in our attitudes, in our words, in our actions, in the way we love each other, Jesus, may the world see you in us. Because if they can even just catch a glimpse, God, we're never the same. Show us your glory. God, help us to love each other well. through all of our differences, through all of our sameness. <laughs> Help us to love each other well, to truly function as the body. That we may be one, as you are one, God. We bless you. We thank you that nothing is too hard for you. Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Brian always likes to say, love somebody, hug somebody, and then you may be seated. I hope that you're standing near somebody that you want to love on and hug, and even if not, you should do it anyway. <laughs> Have a great week. Um, I'm here with Pastor Justin, and we're in the foyer under the connect sign for a really for a really super cool uh, purpose. And we want to talk to you about that for just a few minutes. Um, you know, we, we live right now in a time where we hear the word distant and distance, you know, distant learning. You have to stay away from everybody. And that's just kind of the way things are. But just because we're distant doesn't mean we have to be disconnected. And we want to talk about connecting and what we can do to, to connect over, you know, during, during this time and moving forward in the future. So we're going to talk a little bit about that, inform you. Hopefully it'll strike a chord in your heart that you'll want to be a part of this. And so first off, Pastor Justin, tell us a little bit about what's on the horizon in September for small groups yeah. Um, at Tracy Community Church. Yeah, absolutely. So starting in, in September, come the fall, uh, traditionally our fall semester has looked like meeting here on campus uh, for the women here in the foyer, the men over in the administration building. This fall, since we have to be distant, uh, we don't want to be disconnected. So we're going to start small groups. So what we're going to do is we're going to meet virtually online through a platform called Google Meet. It's a free platform that I will be hosting a training on how to use that. Uh, and we'll have signups online. So we're gonna encourage everyone to move to an online platform. We're gonna have group leaders leading small groups throughout the week. Great thing is we don't have to meet on Wednesday nights because we'll be online. So if there's a time that's more convenient for you, you can have a group leader that has a meeting on you know, Friday afternoons if you're working from home and you have Friday off or Saturdays or Sunday. And that content is gonna be from our Sunday morning services. So the pastor will speak if it's Pastor Brian or someone else. They'll speak and then we will have discussion questions following that Sunday sermon for you to dive deeper into that Sunday morning and be connected in community uh, as it's in our name, Tracy Community Church. We really wanna press in 
to community at this time to keep all of us connected even though we can't meet physically in this building. That's very good. So we really want you to, um, to at the very best of your ability, to find a way, we're going to help you find a way rather, to, to connect with one another. Do you know how many one another's are on the Bible? There's tons of them because that's what community looks like. And, and under kind of different circumstances, um, we're trying to find a way to help us all stay connected together. So that's starting in September, specifically September 13th on that Sunday. We'll yep. launch. We'll have a way for you to uh, sign up. Yep. Yeah. Person. So uh, if you're interested in a small group, we encourage everyone to stay plugged into these groups during this time. There's going to be a sign-up sheet online on our website. So go ahead and fill out, fill out that sign-up sheet, and we'll get you connected to a group leader so you can be a part of one of these small groups. Perfect. Yeah, yeah good. So um, I was going to say pray about it, but I think, man, it's already been prayed over. We th really think it's a really important part of our growth and our sanity and our ability to stay together uh, through some really, really tough, difficult times. None of us work well in isolation. We're all built for community and relationship. And so it will look a little different. Again, Wednesday nights will not look like it used to before. We won't be meeting in the building or Pastor Mike won't be doing a Zoom um, teaching with a, uh, with a talk afterwards. We're not gonna do that this time. Pastor, uh, Pastor Mike is totally on board and is so for this. So we're gonna find a different way to meet and to connect. And so we're really gonna encourage you to go online, sign up, be a part of a small group, Zoom small group, and, uh, and hopefully we can all grow, as Peter says, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So join us um, coming up in September. Keep an eye out for it. We really want you to be a part of something that's super cool, and it will help us all in our growth process. Yeah. Great. Blessings. Welcome to... PG Preaching with Pastor Mitch. You know, I bought this probably 10 years ago because I thought it would be a fun idea to use on the occasions that I speak. But more people remember this folder than they do the content. So if you don't remember anything I say today, just remember the PG folder and it might jog your memory. Well, we're on our series, Unlikely Heroes. And if you've been in church any length of time, chances are you've heard the story about Jesus feeding 5,000. It's one of the only recorded miracles that appears in all four Gospels. But today we're going to look in John chapter 6, verses 1 through 12. And let me give you a little bit of a background. Before this happens, the disciples had just returned from a mission that Jesus sent them on. Jesus sent them around Galilee in pairs. In Matthew 10, 6, it says, As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, Cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. The Bible doesn't state how long the disciples were gone. It could have been a couple days. It could have been a few weeks. It could have been a month. It doesn't say. But what I find amusing is most of the time when we think about Jesus and his disciples, we think of them being together all the time. And this is a time period where Jesus wasn't with his disciples. And if you're like me, I'm curious, and I want to know where he was and what he was doing during this time, but the Bible doesn't say. So the miracle we're going to discuss this morning is not the first miracle that Jesus did. In fact, out of 37 to 40 miracles, according to who you read and what scholar, this is number 19. So the disciples had 18 miracles to watch, and yet when this one happens they're still surprised and amazed at what Jesus can do. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 12. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had performed by healing the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already knew in his mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. 
another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place. And they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Now, I'm going to go over the scripture again just to kind of break it up a little bit. Um, but the first point I want to talk about today is the Jesus perspective versus the logical perspective. Let's get to our story. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he performed by healing the sick. Okay, now it doesn't say if Jesus walked to get to the other side of the Sea of Galilee or if he was in a boat. Let's say he's in a boat. So you're in a boat trying to get away from it all and have a little downtime with your disciples. And apparently they needed downtime too after their mission. But as you're making your way across the lake, you see crowds of people walking and running by the lake following you. Now, when I think of crowds, I think, wow, Walmart sure is crowded today. But I'm talking over 5,000 people are running around the lake to catch up to Jesus. In verse 3, it says, Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. Now, it's interesting. Why would they mention the Passover? I think it's because um, for those who had the ways and means, uh, most would be making preparations or heading to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. Yet here was a multitude of people who were willing to put everything aside so they could be there and watch the man speak and perform miracles. When Jesus looked up, verse 5, when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. You guys, Jesus knows there's a crowd there. He sees their need, and he knows that he's going to have to do something to help them. Philip answers and says, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Now, to be fair, I have to identify with Philip. Because we both think in terms of logic. Philip's counting the money that they have and looking at the crowd. And he's come to the conclusion that no way, not going to happen, Jesus. We don't have enough to get this done. However, logic and logistics never stopped Jesus from doing what needed to be done. This is like a midterm test for the disciples. Because this is about in year number two that they've been with Jesus. And so their midterm test comes up and Philip just got a big fat F because he limits his thinking to the impossible instead of the possible. He's looking through a logical lens instead of looking through a supernatural lens or looking through a Jesus lens. Jesus uses small things. Jesus uses small things to make a big difference. In one of my favorite plays uh, called The Greatest Christmas Pageant Ever, or The Best Christmas Pageant Ever, there's a line that says, there are no small parts, only small actors. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how will they go, how far will they go among so many? In other gospel accounts, Jesus has the disciples figure out what they have to feed the people with. Andrew finds a small boy with a lunch. Andrew received a D on his midterm. Great effort, but then he too questions the quantity versus the masses, the limited versus the limitless. I mean, think about it. These guys have just been on a missions trip. They've just been on a mission where Jesus sent them out and gave them authority to do great miracles. 
They've seen Jesus perform 18 miracles and they still can't grasp the magnitude of who Jesus is and what he can do. Jesus is getting ready to use a little boy in his lunch to do the miraculous. A little boy who is marginalized, not significant enough to be counted among the crowd, an unlikely hero. The crowd was more like 20,000 people. The 5,000 were just men, not the women and children. Have you ever noticed that Jesus spent a large amount of time hanging out with people that were insignificant? Having worked with kids for the last 30 years, I have a few questions. Like, where is this kid's parents? Are they there? Uh, did they just drop him off like a midweek service and go out for a date night or what? It doesn't say that he has parents there at all. And why didn't he eat his lunch? Everyone else around there has no food, and this kid still has a lunch that his mother probably packed for him. And the big question is, what's this kid's name? It doesn't even say his name. This is the only miracle that crosses four books of the Bible, and it doesn't list his name at all. I, in my mind, I have this imaginary conversation made up between Jesus and the little boy. I can see Jesus kneeling down to get to eye level with this boy and asks him if he would like to share his lunch. Maybe Jesus asked him where his parents were. Maybe the little boy answered, I don't know. They're around here somewhere. And I can hear this made up conversation in my head where Jesus says, it's all right, buddy. They'll find you. My parents lost me in Jerusalem for three days once. I'm sure Jesus saw the boy. Andrew basically introduces him to Jesus. Jesus didn't just see a little boy with a little lunch. He saw a boy who was willing to be part of something that was way bigger than he could ever imagine. Jesus didn't see the impossible, but the possible. He saw the potential in one little boy that could change the lives of 20,000 people. Now, I was the children's pastor here at Tracy Community Church for 18 years. And during that time, we would do vacation Bible schools. And there came a point where I really wanted to emphasize missions to the kids uh, at VBS. And I wanted them to have more of a worldview of the gospel. And so we came up with an idea to do this. And we thought, you know what? It would be a great idea if we could uh, partner with a missionary that has a project and we could take offerings during VBS and the kids could be part of that project and help to pay for that project to be accomplished. And so I found a missionary uh, that I had heard of. His name was Tom Hammond. And uh, he was a missionary on the Amazon River. And what he would do is go up and down the Amazon River and find remote villages and go into those villages and give them water filters because there's no clean water on the Amazon to drink. They just drink this nasty, filthy water that's contaminated. And as he goes in there and gives them clean water, he shares the gospel with them. And so I called him. I said, hey, Tom, we would like to partner with you on this. And um, we'll take offerings at VBS. And he said, well, how many kids do you have coming? I said, usually about 60. He goes, well, the filters are kind of expensive. He said, um, but what I can do is we, we also take five-gallon buckets, and those are only like $5 a piece, and the kids could do that. And I said, well, I'd really like them to do the water filters. He goes, okay, we'll see how it works out. So VBS, the backdrops, everything that we taught about was all about the Amazon and about helping the people in the Amazon have clean water, and we would take offerings and have offering contests. One night, uh, a little boy, probably 9 or 10 years old, his mom comes and she said, uh, I just want you to know that last night um, my son asked if he could take all the money out of his savings account to give it to the people in the Amazon to have clean water. And she said, are you sure that's what you want to do? And he said, yeah, mom, that's what I want to do. And being the great mom that she was, she said, okay. And she took his money out and wrote a check and he put it in the offering. Along with that little boy's offering and other kids that gave and some uh, generous parents that gave, they raised around uh, $1,400 to $1,500 in one week for this project. 
I didn't see that coming. I called and I said, hey, Tom, I need your address so I can send you this check. And he goes, oh, well, how much did you guys raise? And I said about fourteen or $1,500. And he goes, wow, I didn't see that coming. He goes, Mitch, do you realize that that will provide an entire village with water filters for them to have clean water for life? And I said, no, I didn't. He goes, that's so awesome. I didn't see it coming. Tom didn't see it coming. But Jesus did. He has the right perspective, and he uses little things to accomplish big things. Jesus said in verse 10, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. In some versions, Jesus has them sit down in groups of 100s and 50s. That's anywhere between 200 and 400 groups of people. Logistics. How long would it take 12 guys to serve 20,000 people? The Bible doesn't say exactly how the miracle occurred. We know that he gave thanks and then there was enough. I mean, I, I can see the bread part. It's, it's like the never ending magic ball where you just keep pulling it off and off and put it in baskets. But come on, when you get to the fish, there's, there's only two fish. And did he, did he break the fish up into little pieces or did he just put fish in a basket? And not to be like sacrilegious, but was it like a magic trick when the card guy goes, whoosh, 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 pulls out cards out of nowhere or just makes it rain like that? I would like to know that. And I'm like, I'm really curious how you did that, Jesus. I know that it's a miracle, but I wish I could have seen that. Those are small things that I want to know why they happened. And when I get to heaven... I'm going to ask Jesus how he did the trick. Okay. If you think it takes a long time to serve communion at your church, imagine serving communion to 20,000 people. Just think about it. Jesus fed 20,000 people with a little boy's lunchable. And what about the boy? What was the boy doing when this was taking place? Now, every year that I did children's ministry here, we did an Easter extravaganza. And all but two of those years, I did a magic show to explain what Easter meant to the kids. And I'm, I'm not very good at it, but um, I would always call a, a young child to come up, maybe between the ages of three and six, to come up and to be my assistant. And it would never fail that when the trick was completed you could see the look of awe and wonder in this child's eyes. And then two things would happen. First, their jaw would drop open. And second, they would turn and look at the audience like, did you just see what I just saw? And I can't help but think that maybe the little boy did the same thing. I doubt if he just sat there and watched He's probably jumping up and down going, do you see that? That's my lunch. Do you see what he's doing with my lunch? That's my lunch. And that's probably something that never left that little boy's mind or heart for the rest of his life. To know that he played a part in doing something grand, doing something huge that affected the kingdom of God. Stop trying to think for God. Verse 12. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. There they are, the 12 disciples, standing there holding 12 full baskets of leftovers in front of Jesus. What an object lesson. I can only imagine Jesus just looking at him going, now guys, tell me again that we don't have the means to feed this many people. Seriously, stop trying to think for God. I'm pretty sure he's got it all figured out. 
I think we overthink and complicate things sometimes. And oftentimes we let God know what we think he should do. When in reality, we should be waiting and listening to see what God wants us to do. When Jesus looks at you, he doesn't see the limited. He sees the limitless potential that he has created you to have. He doesn't see the person that you think you are. He sees the person he created you to be. And let me, let me close with some questions for you that you can um, ponder and think over and ask yourself uh, when we're done here today. Number one, what lens are you looking through? How are you viewing other people, situations, world events, even yourself? Try looking from a different perspective. Try looking through a different lens. Try looking at it the way Jesus would look at it. Number two, is there something in your life, a gift, a talent, that you thought was too small or too insignificant for God to use? Don't overlook or take for granted the great things that God can accomplish through small things. Don't take for granted what your child can do for the kingdom of God. Look for the small things, not only in your children's lives, but in your lives as well. There are no small parts in the plan of God, only small players. Number three, have you ever tried to outthink God? Stop, just stop. When God teaches you something, sometimes the best thing you can do is to be quiet and listen and then figure out what you're going to do with this new knowledge and information and how you're going to apply it to your life and how it can benefit the kingdom of God. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you love us enough to allow us to see life and things through a different perspective, through a different lens. Help us to view things through a lens of love and compassion the way that you do. Help us to remember that no matter how insignificant we may feel in the scope of things, in the scope of eternity, in the scope of um, the universe, we're small in comparison but we know that you can use small things. Help us remember that, that nothing that we have that we can offer is too small for you to use. And help us not to question you. It's okay to question you, but help us not to like try to outthink you. Help us to be um, slow to speak and quick to listen to your voice and what you want us to do with our lives and what we can do to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, amen. Well, thank you for tuning in today, and stay tuned next week as we continue with our series, Unlikely Heroes.